Welcome to another installment of the Digital Cinema Show, a series covering the art, science, and business of motion pictures. We begin this episode interviewing Academy Award-winning cinematographer Russell Carpenter, ASC. Russell gives us heartfelt advice gleaned from his long and illustrious career, shooting such movies as Titanic, Ant-Man, and True Lies. He tells us about how to deal with both rejection and success. He also stresses the importance of showing respect for one's fellow filmmaking collaborators and the need to maintain a relaxed atmosphere on the set where actors can feel safe to create their best performances. The interview was part of the 2017 DCS Cinema Lighting Expo, which took place at the IATSE Grips Local 80 Stage in Burbank on March 4th. Next, I want to pay tribute to a friend and hero of mine who recently passed away by sharing behind-the-scenes coverage of his final project. Wayne Schoenfeld was not only a successful entrepreneur, but also a gifted photographer and philanthropist. When faced with the dim prognosis that he likely didn't have too much longer to live, Wayne returned to the art form he loved and used it in service of others. You'll hear from Wayne in his own words, reflect back on his life as he created his last two series of photos entitled The Garden of Earthly Delights and The Final Judgment. Continue watching to view the entire episode or use the separate links to jump ahead to the segment that may be of particular interest to you. In either case, thank you for joining us for the Digital Cinema Show. We welcome your input, so please follow us on Vimeo, YouTube, or our Facebook page. If you would like to support our efforts, please also consider joining the Digital Cinema Society. Membership is available to anyone, whether you can afford it or not. It's always free to students. We suggest a $30 annual contribution from those who can afford it and $100 for a lifetime membership. We could not provide this content without the continued support of our sponsors, in particular OWC, manufacturer of innovative SSD, storage, and connectivity solutions, designed to improve the performance and extend the life of technology used by today's demanding production and post professionals. I'm really proud to have uh, my old friend, Mr. Russell Carpenter, ASC. And when I say old, it's not just because I'm old, but I've known this guy a long, long time. But let's talk about uh, a little bit about Russell's career. Uh, he's known for, uh, well, an Academy Award for Titanic. He's also known for Ant-Man, um, True Lies, a big action movie that was just out, Triple uh, X, Return of uh, Xander Cage, two times Charlie's Angel movies, so uh, you're known for doing beauty lighting. You're known for doing uh, action movies. You're known for doing both at the same time with uh, Charlie's Angels. Yeah. And I think you're known also for being one of the nicest guys in show business. Of, of the <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, I guess it's been, we've known each other since about 1976 or something like That's that. That's right. <laughs> there, yeah, there are a lot of people out there that, who were just fetuses then. Yeah, there's, uh, there's one, uh, one of your big credits I didn't mention called Soul Survivor. Yes. In the early 80s, where we worked together. Yes. I was the <laughs> production manager. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't know exactly. We, I know we only have about 15 minutes, but I, I, because I didn't have a demo prepared, and uh, uh, next time I'll bring a reel or something to, to show, but... Uh, I want to talk about something sort of off topic to gear and stuff like that. And I don't know how many of you are I'm looking at people who have been in the industry for a long time and some who are starting. And I, I, I wanted to talk about failure, uh, massive, tragic failure. And, and Jim and, and was you're looking at me. Here yeah. it is. No, and, no. Uh, Jim and I worked on this, my first uh, film as a, that uh, I ever got a credit on was uh, Soul Survivor. And when I realized that the movie, uh, the director and I realized that the movie was, was going to be uh, actually released in theaters, I, I just thought I had totally made it. And I was so looking forward to people, come out, uh, people coming out to see the film and all the adulation and stuff that of course would, would uh, travel in the footsteps of the film. And uh, the film came out the next day, there was a review in the uh, LA Times, and I was mentioned. Uh, uh, the mention was the murky 
abysmal lighting for the film. And I just felt when I saw that in print that somebody had just taken a, a tw like a 12 foot javelin and just rammed it through my throat and pinned me to a wall. And um, it's really weird to me because we, especially when we read our credits off, uh, we usually, of course, we're gonna list our triumphs. But I think that, uh, you know, after I read that interview, I thought I would never work again. And I went through several interviews on several movies where I thought I would never work again. And I think, I, I, I think all I, I would like to, for, for those of you who are, who are uh, you know, in the middle of your journey, uh, I, I think, yes, it's about uh, our aspiration to, to create, if, if we're working in feature photography or, or the dramatic narrative, to create, a, to create an architecture of light that, that, and, and three dimensions on a two-dimensional screen that people can walk into and inhabit. Uh, a, a believable light that, that supports and tells a, a story that people can disappear into. But behind the scenes, uh, there are those long times of not working. Uh, there are uh, rejections upon rejections upon rejections that, that nobody ever hears about. Uh, and so I think for me, you know, I just, in terms of the whole journey in a nutshell, because we've only got 15 minutes, is I just think that people have to, it, it, yes, it's about that world we want to create and what you want to do, but it's also about the long-term the long -term journey of learning tranquility and uh, some acceptance of uh, the nosedives. And, and uh, uh, I think, the one thing that helped me moving along was that I realized that I had to uh, learn how not to take rejection so personally, and, and because nothing is personal, basically, and in in, uh, I found. But also that the town is a, uh, it, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, LA is huge, but also that's small. And if you have a really bad day on the set, People are gonna gonna hear about that, and basically, you turn into a brand. And even if you're doing, uh, and I'm saying that in the best sense of when you think of this person, who do you think of? And, and say say you're 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 working as a one man band with the the lighting that we we just saw. We go out, but you have to remember that every day you're branding yourself. And if if, if you're branding yourself as a jerk. Or, 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 or somebody who's not tranquil on the set, or, or on the other hand, you're branding yourself as somebody who's really willing to, you know, uh, put out an effort and, and be a very lovely person to be around. Uh, that counts too. So, uh, uh, well, that's all I got. No. Well, <laughs> that does, you know, yeah. feed into what I was saying. You know, yeah. that you're you're a nice guy and. Uh, you don't have to be a jerk to be a successful DP. Yeah, I and I think I had to learn that along, along the way. I, I think, you know, I, I'm looking at. This is the first time I've been here, and I realize that a lot of the people here are trying to create, you know, very uh, elegant lighting, uh, some depth to the image, and they can only do it with one or two lights, max, maybe three lights if they're lucky, but. But of course, there are ways to do that, and then there, are, of course, there are ways to do that on time too, under all those pressures. But uh, I, when I was starting out, and of course, when you're working with in, in features, uh, you you're usually working with a, a fairly large group of people, and you're interacting with a lot of people. And as a cinematographer in features, you're, you're wearing four hats. One, the artist you always wanted to be, and you, you were sure you could be, but now you've got to be do it in five minutes instead of uh, 30 minutes. You need to be a bit of a technician. Uh, some people are great technicians, and maybe their forte isn't lighting. They let somebody else do that. You've got to be uh, a manager, 
And you've also got to be a politician. By politician, I, I don't mean you have to glad hand your way around through life, but uh, have a sense of comportment on the set. So even if there is a tragedy, you know, crane doesn't show up, something doesn't show up, the power goes out, people will look at you and they'll, they'll look at your level of uh, agitation. And, it, and sometimes if you're agitated, they'll get more agitated. Uh, so there are a lot of things that you, that you learn. And I, I thought, especially when I was starting out, it was like, oh, I, I think my passion for what I wanted to do translated in, into sometimes being impatient, running over other people in a sense, or, or just being, being uh, you know, not, not as, as polite as I could be. And what I had to learn, and it only, it only took, you know, five decades, is that going, going along, you can, you can still produce some really luscious stuff and have a great time uh, during the day doing it. And you have to remember, I think you would agree, that uh, a lot of times the actors that you're working with are highly insecure. And, um, and that's part of your job, too. That's part of the politics that uh, yeah, you Yeah, th th that's what it is. It, it's political in the sense of uh, learning that no matter how uh, much, much uh, expertise or experience somebody might have, or even if they're new, you're, what you're trying to do, not, not only capture uh, a great image, but you're also creating a space where the person who gets out in front of your camera is very comfortable and able to be themselves. And you know, so, so your bedside manner, uh, you learn to perfect that too. So uh, it, it, you know, no matter what level you're working at, uh, how you are, how, that energy that you're creating on the set is going to have a, quite, an, a, quite an effect uh, on both the actor or the, or the interviewee. Do you have any tips for how to make a, an actress feel comfortable? Well, for me, in, in features, that starts uh, at the very beginning. Uh, we, in a feature film, if you've, if you've got any resources at all, you, you usually get at least one day of uh, makeup and wardrobe test. Sometimes that's the very first time you meet uh, your actor or actress. And what I, you know, because I've usually studied, if I hadn't had a chance to really do much testing or any testing, I study the films that the actor or actress has been in. But on that day uh, that I'm doing my tests, I usually try and keep them as simple as possible and as elegant as possible. And I get not only do I get the actor actors through that process in a way that they don't feel like they are a prop on the set. That's the last thing uh, uh, an, an actor wants to feel like they're a prop in your movie. What you, I, and I, that took me a while to learn and there were some painful lessons along the way, but I realized that once the camera rolls, the, the actor or actress, they're putting everything on the line. And they're why people come to see the movie, and they're they're on the hot seat, so they need to feel some, you know, that that they were with, with friends. But going back to the idea of shooting tests, uh, I make sure that they see that I am taking care about how they look. I just I just kind of transfer that, let them know that I really care about how they look, and of course that's primary. Well, you've told us about how you dealt with failure. How do you deal with huge success? You must have picked up a few I, I, I dealt too. with uh, huge success. I mean, I, you have to point to the Academy Award. Uh, uh, worse than I dealt with failure. I had, I, I had, I had uh, become very familiar with failure for a while, and that I could handle. Success was really weird because I, I think I put pressure on myself to go, oh, you've got to do some sort of repeat right away. And that didn't happen. And, uh, and uh, so I, I just had a, an inner dialogue that I had to, to kind of face down and come to grips with. And, and realize, like right now, well, th this is part of my, my therapy. I shoot a lot of stills. And I, 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 
the world of feature films is all about things being just so, people looking just so. Your job, as, as, as unfair as this seems, you, you, you get incredibly good looking people and then your job is supposed to make them look better. And, uh, and they're, they're with, uh, there's wardrobe and makeup and lighting. And uh, it's, a, it's a world that, that to me, it, I really love being on the set. I really love working on the set. But at the end of the day, that's kind of a weird world to me. So I go out and I've, uh, I've learned a lot from watching other photographers on Instagram. So I got an Instagram account and I go out and I, I'm kind of like a paparazzi now for, for people on the fringes of the, uh, the world. And I go, uh, uh, I was in Bali for a couple of months and I would wade out into the water and just take pictures of the Balinese who I find to be such generous and joyful people. But, I'm much more interested now in the, in the uncontrolled things that happen in an instant. And it's, I guess it's, so it's more in the street photography side of things. And that comes back and nourishes what I do on the, on the set. So I think uh, just, just, just not spending 110% of my life on a set has been a very healthy thing for me. You, you can't work yourself to death. You have you to cannot uh, work yourself replenish to death. yourself once yeah, in a while. Absolutely. Any uh, other tips you'd like to share? <laughs> I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe when I come back next year, I'll <laughs> do something with lighting and, and stuff like that. But I, I'm sure there have been more, more uh, other lighting demos. Yeah. I just want to thank you for you know, coming out. And especially, I know you've been, you just got into the country yeah. from Indonesia. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I, last time I saw you, you looked like you were pretty whipped because you had just come I off was a, a long, long movie. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, uh, I'm sure everybody appreciates it, and I sure do. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. I would like to tell you about a friend and hero of mine who we lost recently. His name is Wayne Schoenfeld, a successful entrepreneur, a fine art photographer, and a philanthropist. I got to know Wayne as he started hiring me many years ago uh, to document his very elaborate photo shoots from which he would derive beautiful prints that would be sold with the proceeds going to benefit charity. What makes Wayne even more remarkable than his many accomplishments and charitable endeavors is that when he knew he probably only had a short time to live due to a diagnosis of lung cancer, he devoted his energy to his art. I documented his last shoot where Wayne metaphorically looked back on his life and what might lie ahead as a final judgment. Be forewarned if you're offended by it that there is some nudity, which Wayne explains in the piece is integral to his art. Almost two years ago, I had um, an unexpected health issue and a brush with my own mortality. I was reminded that life was finite and that all of us only have so many days to accomplish those things that are important to us. I started to think about my own life and what was important to me. If I was going to leave a, a legacy, what did I want that legacy to be? And when the moment came that there would be some final judgment, um, how would I be judged and who would make that judgment? So I thought about it and I tried to struggle with using the art form that I knew best, photography, to create a tableau vivant that told the story of my journey through my life and the final judgment. I've done a, a number of photographs in the past on the circus, and so I had this vision of me walking through life on a tightrope, tempted by the seven deadly sins, uh, by lust and by gluttony and pride, and, and always trying to stay on this tightrope, never tempted off of 
this path that for me was my journey through my life. Seven Deadly Sins were just kind of a jumping off place because as I thought about my own life and I think the life of most men, um, lust or the fantasy of some kind of sexual intrigue seems to be uh, the motivation that, that drags us through. If we, if we want power, it's because that power will make us attractive to women. If we want money, it's, it's because we think money will make us attractive to women. And so, uh, peppered throughout the individual representations of the seven deadly sins are naked and attractive women. And so there was anger. And in this scene, um, we had a man about to lay a punch onto this woman who's screaming in pride, a um, little vignette. Um, there's a man in a, a military uniform, lots of medals and chest sticking out and looking at himself in the mirror. And with him is this attractive woman. And in front of them is a slothful character uh, being fed grapes on a couch. Looking from a doorway behind them is representing envy. Um, for gluttony, we had a man. It's in the background. You don't really see much of it, but he's there with two women. For greed, we have a man standing next to piles of gold and money hanging out of every pocket. And of course, a naked woman hanging on to him. I have a a musical group that we set up because I thought that this is a scene that needs to have the blues, sort of Billy Holiday kind of music. And so uh, we have this, I mean, she actually sang. It wasn't just a, a setup, it had a beautiful a cappella voice. And so we spent a, a full day preparing and then half a day shooting this uh, representation of me on a tightrope, being tempted by all of the seven deadly sins. The second scene was the final judgment. And for me, the final judgment was uh, a personal matter of how I viewed my own life and, and my journey through this. And so I wanted to create a tableau that looked reminiscent, kind of a Michelangelo style God uh, judging me. And in this tableau, of course, I had to be both God and myself being judged. In the previous shot, all of the male faces had masks that made them seem anonymous. And in this revelation, this final judgment, um, I removed my mask and was naked in front of myself, judging um, how I had done. And so this diptych uh, was the personal story of my final judgment. I've been fortunate enough to have a few business successes that have given me the freedom to um, go out and feel comfortable as an artist and as a storyteller and to look for ways that what I did could benefit others. In my career, I started out as a psychologist and wound up owning a large chain of psychiatric clinics. Um, I got interested in airplanes and started an airline that I took public. Um, and I had the opportunity to work with my father-in-law in the motion picture industry. Lynn Dunn, great guy. Um, and we started a business that was probably the first serious attempt to lead the motion picture industry from analog to digital. These financial successes have given me the uh, the freedom to go out and to use my skill and my talents to try and help uh, some humanitarian projects around the world. I've done 
a number of books and um, documentary films on a group of volunteer surgeons, rotoplast, traveled with them all over the world. I've been uh, really impressed with an organization called Exico that a friend of mine started in, in Montreal. And so I finance these projects. Um, the artwork that I do, I've been fortunate it's been recognized um, all over the world and sells for some pretty hefty prices. All of the proceeds of that goes to support these various charities that um, are meaningful to me. And so as I take a look at how I've done on this narrow path, this tightrope uh, surrounded by temptations, um, I feel like I've done a, a pretty good job in my life of staying on the, the, the tightrope, not being lured off. And I'm confident that at that moment, when I make the final judgment, uh, when I look back on my life, um, that I'll have done okay. Thank you.